a big old woman. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> uh, I am being taped, correct? That would change what I say. <laughs> okay. So sometimes I talk about Western Median Cutworm. That's what Jody's re referring to. But this area doesn't have a big problem with Western Median Cutworm. So I'm going to talk about something different that has been uh, quite popular on the roadshow. So the pictures I'm going to show you in this presentation are not mine. They are from Ken Osley, who's the entomologist at University of Minnesota. And the data that I'm going to show you is from uh, Aaron Gassman, who's the entomologist at, at Iowa State. So what I'm going to talk about is not something we necessarily have in Michigan, but I want you to be aware of. This is about in the newspaper, and I want you to be aware of, of what's going on. Uh, so we haven't really dealt with corn rootworm in the last few years. It's been pretty quiet. I'm going to show you root ratings in my presentation. And just to remind you what, what the root ratings are, they go from 0 to 3. That's the root rating scale. 0 means no damage. A 1, a 2, or a 3 means entire nodes gone. So I don't know if there's a pointer on here. I'm afraid to touch a button. There we go. OK. So uh, I have some pictures up here for those, for those in the front that show three whole nodes gone. That would not be an acceptable level of damage for an or an insecticide or a transgenic. Uh, so if you're seeing like a one, two, or three on a rating scale, that, that would be bad. Economic injury can often occur after a 0.5, so half of a node gone uh, if the plant can replace uh, water, and sometimes down to a 0.25, even a quarter of a node pruned back to within about a half an inch. So I use my pinky finger as kind of an indication of what we do about an inch or so, and uh, that's the kind of damage that that, that we're going to talk about. So just a reminder of what types of BT corn we have now for, for uh, rootworm. The first types of corn that we had out was the Monsanto uh, type in 2003. It, the protein that's in it is called Cry3BB1. And it's the type of protein you're going to get if you purchase yield guard, uh, one of the BT triples, or it's one of the components in the smart stack. Uh, Dow and Pioneer have a different protein called Cry3435. That's what's in the Herculex product, the Optimum products, and it's the second component in smart stacks. And then Syngenta has a different protein. So there's three different options out there for rootworm control. So corn rootworm and corn borer corns are different. Corn borer corn, which came out first in 1996, is very high dose. And when the corn borer takes a little bite and, and ingests a little bit of that, it dies pretty quickly. And you would not find living corn borers that were growing in your field. If you did, there would be something wrong. So corn borer corn is high dose. It's very, very effective. Rootworm corn is, is at least the Cry3BB type, is moderate dose. And the expression within that plant can actually be variable. So especially in, in the root zone, Different roots are going to express different amounts of protein. And it was very common, even from the, from the beginning, when you walked into rootworm corn, to see beetles coming out of the ground, because some survive. They might get sick, but they survive, because it's moderate dose. So that's always been a difference from that to the corn borer corn. The resistance genes has actually been relatively easy, not super easy, but relatively easy to select for rootworm resistance in the, in the lab. So we know the genes for resistance exist. And compared to corn borer, which will fly half mile or mile or so to go mate, rootworm beetles, uh, especially the males, not making judgment, no, both of them, they're pretty lazy. So if they don't have to go very far to mate, they're not going to go half a mile. They're going to, the males are going to wait for the female to come out of the ground, and they might mate pretty locally. And we know that as more and more rootworm products have come out, or more and more types of BT corn, compliance has gone down with the refuge for whatever reason. So we, there is survey data to show that that compliance has kind of trended down. So in 2009, my colleague in Minnesota, who's a rootworm expert, his career is built on rootworm, was starting to get phone calls from southern Minnesota uh, talking about, you know, saying there was corn that was falling onto the ground and it was a corn rootworm issue. So this is one of those fields. This is a VT triple product, and this field is laying on the ground. And the farmer looks like he's kind of smiling, but I don't think he's actually thinking that. And this was happening kind of in that southern part of Minnesota 
down by, here's the, here's the Twin Cities area, here's the Rochester area, and I'm going to show you pictures from the southeastern area. So here's one of these photos. The grower, or at least one of the growers here had an aircraft, which is pretty cool, because you get to go over here and take pictures. And you can clearly see the refuge areas here and the BT areas here. So if you look, you can see the smaller refuge strips. So this was a refuge treated with Aztec soil insecticide. It did pretty well. You can see the nice straight rows. The lodging was less than 1% of the plants falling over. And these fields had really heavy corn root pressure. Uh, I assume they were corn, corn on corn kind of situation. The root rating is a little over a 0.5. So it's on the high side of acceptable for the soil insecticide, but, but sometimes beetles escape the soil insecticide and they're not killed. So a 0.5 is probably, a 0.6 here is probably as good as you can get. Now between the refuge rows, we have a BT triple product. This was expressing cry 3 BT protein, and it was tested to make sure that it was expressing. And you can see here all these kind of dark areas. That's corn that's lodged. It has fallen over. And a third of, of that corn in, in those uh, BT strips was actually lodged. And the root rating was over a 2, which means two nodes of roots gone. And that's not acceptable for a BT triple product. So here's a close-up of some of those areas, and the corn is locked over as if there was nothing there, as if it was just a conventional corn, but it's not. This is a BT corn. So uh, uh, can the entomologist was playing a game called Where is the Refuge? And in this case, you can definitely see this is the field that has the strips, and the strips are standing, and the BT triple in between has fallen down. Where's the refuge in this field? It's around the border. So the, the picture frame is standing. This again, that's the refuge. This is a uh, BT in the middle, and a lot of that was falling down. So this is another field, a different field in the, in the neighborhood. I don't know if it's owned by the same person or not. There's a refuge there. The person has done the right thing, but it's the refuge that's standing and not the BT triple. Where's the refuge here? <coughs> Across the road, here? No, here. What about this part? This part looks pretty good. This part is clearly lodged. There's a lot of lodging in here. This is interesting. Half this field is cry 3 BB. It's a BT triple kind of product. This front half is not the refuge. It's Herculex rootworm. It's the, it's the cry 34, 35. It's a different type of BT. So this is lodged and this is not. Where's the refuge here? Where's Sean? Is he sleeping? Where's the refuge, Sean? Are you going to pick on me? I don't know. Because like, he had me, because I had you for class. It's in the barn. Dang it. It's in the barn. There was no refuge here. And this is also part of the problem is in this neighborhood, some not planting up the refuge. So this is a neighborhood that has a lot of continuous corn, a lot of cry 3 BB through B BT triple in some of those products and then some fields that there is, is no refuge. So uh, this very happy young man is Aaron Gassman, and uh, he's a young entomologist at Iowa State, and I don't think he worked on corn before. Growers in the northern part of Iowa were also having these kind of problems, and they, when they called the seed dealers, sometimes they weren't getting satisfaction, and uh, somehow this filtered to the university, to Aaron, who was working on corn, and Aaron's background it, I don't know all of it, but it, it, he was working on BT genetics in cotton and some of the resistance issues there. So uh, he had some background in this and this kind of interested him. So he went out to some of these fields in 2009 to try to see what was going on. And he didn't have tenure or anything yet, so that's why he's so happy. He's thinking, oh good, I have a problem to work on. So he classified two types of fields. There's problem fields and control fields. And problem fields, these were all grower fields. They all have a lot of lodging. Uh, root rating on these fields when he dug the roots was almost a two, two nodes of roots gone. These plants tested positive for BT, so it's not a mistake. There's really BT being made. And all these fields were continuous corn and three to six years continuous planting of Cry3BB through like a BT triple product. 
and they had really severe feeding and injury. The control fields did not have that kind of characteristic. They had no lodging, and if you look in the history of these control fields, there's been a lot of crop rotation in, the, in these fields. Maybe cry 3 b be once or twice, but mostly there's a lot of corn and soybean uh, being, being uh, planted. So what Aaron did was he went out to these fields and he collected females, females with eggs. And you bring the females back to the lab and they go into these little cages and they lay eggs. Now rootworm eggs will not just hatch. You have to give them a cold period. They have to, in, in nature, they're living in the ground for the winter. And in a lab, you have to do the same thing. They just won't hatch. So this is like delayed gratification. He had to keep these eggs in, in a cold place for several months and then he could hatch them out. And he put a certain number of eggs and no number of eggs on different types of corn. Conventional corn, BT triple corn, or a Herculex type of corn. And then after 17 days, he can see those eggs had hatched and how many larvae actually survived eating that corn. So I'm gonna show you his data. I didn't generate this. This is his data from 2009. So let me show you how to read these tables. In the first two bars here, these are rootworms, the percentage of them surviving on corn that does not have any BT. And the next set of bars are rootworms surviving on corn that's making cry 3 bb and, and should kill a lot of them. The black bar, these are beetles that originated the eggs that came out of problem fields. And the gray bars are the eggs where they came out of the control fields, which were rotated and didn't have a lot of damage, didn't have any damage. So in this first set, these are beetles that are being fed on the conventional corn, and their survival is the same. It's about 50 to 60%. That's pretty typical in a, in a greenhouse assay. If you look at the next set, though, the beetles from the problem fields are surviving at a higher rate than the beetles coming out of the control fields. They're able to survive this, the cry 3 dB better, or at least a proportion of them. Then if you look at the same thing, but done on the Herculex corn, again, the survival is the same from the beetles from the problem and control fields on the non-BT, but if you look at them, come, if they're being fed on the Herculex, it's also the same and the survival is very low. So what that tells us is these beetles aren't surviving the Herculex types of corn, they're surviving the Cry3BB. It's a Cry3BB problem. It's not a Cry3435 problem, and it's not cross-resistance. Well, you know, you can expect he got criticized for this work a lot uh, from people. You know, how can you repeat this? Is this really true? This because this would be something bad. This would is suggesting that there's resistance to a BT in the field. And if that's the case, that would be the first reported resistance in the US to a BT by an insect in the field, naturally. So he went back and uh, in the next year, he found more problem fields. He got a lot more phone calls in 2010. And these fields were three to seven years continuous planting of Cry3BB over and over again, up to seven years. That's about as long as you could have planted Cry3BB. Then as his control, he went across the US and he went to these places that have colonies, colonies of rootworms. And these colonies were created before Rootworm corn for BT was ever planted in the, in the US. So these are beetles that have never been exposed in their history to BT corn or corn rootworm. So these are our older colonies. And he did the same experiment again. And he found the exact same thing. So on the conventional corn, they survived the same. But on the BT corn with Cry3BB, the, the beetles coming out of his problem fields survive way better. You know, 30% as opposed to almost none. And if you look here again, uh, beetles, if, if you look at the survival on Cry 34, 35, those in the back can't see, but it's very, very low for both populations. So they're surviving Cry 3 BB, but they're being killed by the Cry 34, 35. So this is showing the exact same data, again, just with a second run with different beetles. In 2011, there's even more calls. And not just calls here, there's calls occurring in the southern part of Minnesota too, on a widespread, on a more widespread area. So he went back out to a couple fields from 2009, 
Uh, he planted actual plots. So he put BTs, two different, two or three types of BT, with and without insecticide. And he not only dug roots and raided them, he put in these, these little cages here called emergence cages. What's coming out of the ground? It is very typical with rootworm corn to find survivors that are coming up out of the ground. And the way we know that is we, we make these little cages. This is one of mine. You stick it over a corn plant. The beetles come out of the ground, and in theory, they go into that little mason jar there. Sometimes they don't cooperate, but most of the time they do. So they come up into that mason jar, and, and you can count them. And it, in a BT corn, you can get maybe two or three that typically come up. And out of a non-BT corn, you might get 10 or 12 or 15 that come out of the ground. So ignore this. That was great. I don't know why that happened. But these three bars are what happened in non-BT corn. This is the root rating. If you just planted non-BT corn in these fields, the root rating is a two and a quarter. Sean, how many nose is that? I'm keeping you awake. Two and a quarter. OK, very good. He's not this week. He was always like that in class, though, so you know. two, two, two and a quarter nose. If I put force, or if he, if he put force on the non-BT, or if you put Aztec on it, you could drive that root rating down, especially with the Aztec here. It's even under a 0.5, so that's a very acceptable level of control for that for that soil insecticide. So on the known BT, that's the levels that, that, that we're looking at in these fields. Very heavy pressure, 2.0 on the root rating. Here's the root rating for the Cry 3 BB. So Cry 3 BB alone is coming off at about a one and a half. So that would be not very acceptable level of damage. If I add insecticide, then it's under 0.5 again. So, so it seems like pretty much here the primary community is doing something. There's still some efficacy here on some of the population, but a lot more of the work is being done by adding the insecticide. And then at the end here, here's a prime 34, 35. This would be a Herculex rootworm grown in the same soil. And then this is the smart stacks. There's still a little bit of an effect. Remember, the smart stacks is cry 3 bb and cry 34 35 pyramided together, stacked, stacked together. So here's the the uh, the amount of control from this from the cry 3 bb, and you get a little bit of decrease here uh, if you add. So, so this is the cry 34 35, and then you get a little bit uh, more control because of the cry 3 bb. But the smart stacks side of the equation, the cry 3 bb part of the equation, is still holding up in this in this field. So the other question was how many beetles are actually emerging? So here's the number of beetles coming out in non-BT, non-BT plus horse, and non-BT plus Aztec. Six to eight per cage. That'd be pretty typical. You get some survivors, not right where the roots join. The, uh, the, the actual plant, but kind of, they, they can feed on some of the small roots between the rows and survive. Here, here's the number of beetles coming off of the transgenic, off the cry 3 bb And this is very concerning because it's not down here at one or two, it's up here at six or eight. And those are the beetles that are potentially resistant. So they're then mating. Remember, the whole reason you planted a refuge, it's all about sex. It's all about mating. You're trying to get mating and dilute the genes out. If you have a lot of survivors coming out of that transgenic, you know, you're getting brothers and sisters mating. You're getting closely related insects mating. And potentially, you've now got more resistance in that population. And then here's the number of beetles coming off of either a smart stacks or the Perculex, which would be a more typical number. So in these problem areas, We've got three years, there's three years of data from the field and the lab, from Aaron's lab, uh, that show that there's elevated corn rootworm survival and damage on the cry 3 bb like the BT triple type type of corn. And there's no evidence of cross resistance to the other toxin. When, what does this mean? Well, we just reduced refuges recently, right? We've gone from these 20% refuges to the rootworm products to 5% refuges, and also to refuge in the bag. And the reason that that was allowed was because there are two, the assumption is, there's two toxins in there hammering on the corn rootworm. There's just not one toxin, there's two. So when you get two, you're allowed to reduce the refuge or go to a refuge in the bag. 
But in these problem areas, it seems like one of the toxins is failing. And you can call it resistance, you can debate with me, is this resistance? Most of the entomologists think it's resistance. Uh, EPA and other people are thinking about resistance. You, if you don't want to call it resistance because you don't like that word, you can call it failure. You can call it uh, uh, balloons. I don't care what you call it. But the Bt corn is not, is not working in these, in these areas. And if you reduce the refuge, you've now uh, in gone to a, to a refuge in the bag. Uh, that was based on the assumption that two genes were working in, say, the smart stacks corn, not, not just one. So similar problems are now being reported, not just in Iowa or southern part of Minnesota, but in the last year or so, uh, Illinois, South Dakota, and the, Nebraska. And there are likely other areas, the, I guess the assumption would be that in other states, there might be areas with this kind of characteristic that we may be having populations of, of rootworm potentially showing resistance or seeing field failures. And that would be areas with continuous corn that have planted Cry3BB over and over again, and especially if there's been some non-planting of refuges. So what about Michigan? In general, we have lower rootworm populations than you know, what they report in southern Minnesota or parts of Iowa. But we do have areas that are hot spots. North of the MSU campus in that St. John's area, uh, there's a hot spot in there. I call that my rootworm black hole because there's a lot of dairy production, a lot of continuous corn. And that area, even when I first planted a Cry3BB hybrid up there, like in 2005, I had them emerging out of the ground, very, very heavy pressure. So there are areas, some small areas of, of, of heavy pressure in Michigan that could be at risk, but in general, we have more crop rotation than some of these other states, more crop diversity, and lower populations. To reduce your risk, if you're one of these people that is growing continuous corn, or uh, uh, really kind of concerned about this, follow whatever refuge requirements there are, because it's, it's a requirement, not a suggestion. Uh, rotate technology.